Hitler. We're back. We're live. We're here at 2 o'clock on Friday with Community Matters. We care deeply about the community. We care, therefore, deeply about any election, and especially the mayoral election coming up. And we have a candidate for mayor right here in the studio, and uh, he's Ron Hokley, and he's a, an old acquaintance of mine going way back. Thank you for coming down, Ron. Oh, thanks for having me, Jake. Very You're much. You're running for mayor. Why? Oh, I, I got fed up with the way the city is going. Uh, didn't like how the finances are being spent and how we're taking care of our people. Thought the focus is wrong. I uh, felt that special interests were in a, intruding on good decisions, the setting of proper priorities. And just got so angry one day that I said I'm going to run for mayor without any planning or forethought, but to say, hey, before I die, I want to do something, you know, uh, to contribute because I think things can be much better than they are. Well, you're into community. Um, you, you had a successful business career, yeah. you retired, and now you're spending your time uh, doing community work, am I right? Yes, yes. Uh, in fact, when I retired, I got into a lot of volunteer work that led to some full-time work. I was the director of the homeless shelter up on the Big Island when I was living over there for a couple of years and uh, uh, directed the Kauai High Community Shelter. And, uh, and then I came, when I came back to, oh, and that lasted there until people, uh, we, they, we found a replacement came back to Ho, uh, Honolulu and was volunteering at uh, the Youth Challenge Academy, the National Guard Youth Challenge Academy uh, for youth who dropped out of school. And that led to me taking over and running the program. So yeah, I've been doing quite a few things. Why? Uh, I love Hawaii. I love the people of Hawaii. Uh, my heart is just, you know, full uh, for what I've been given here in Hawaii, the values, uh, the people I've met, you know, my family's all been raised here. In fact, it's really interesting. I'm the only Haole in my family. You know, I, I married a Filipino girl, had children. They've married uh, Hawaiian or Puerto Rican, you know. So when we get together for family, <laughs> uh, it's, local style. It's really local style. So um, you're not a politician. No. You're on the neighborhood board for a while? I am. You are I'm, now? I am on the neighborhood board at Eva Beach. Okay. Neighborhood board. But other than that, you're really not. You're a business person and maybe a community worker kind of person right. who volunteers for things. But um, why, why, did, why does your life in business and uh, your life in general qualify you to be mayor of this very complex, difficult, and sometimes troublesome city? Boy, that's for sure. Uh, I think I'm qualified, I feel I'm qualified for fiscal reasons. I had a lot of uh, business dealings with people. They trusted their savings and their future to me, and I was able to help them and deliver on my promises. I really understand money, and I understand the value of money to human beings. But early on in my life, I, I studied to be a Catholic priest and lived eight years as a monk in the Catholic religious order and taught over here at St. Louis in Chaminade. And there, there's a great deal of emphasis on compassion. You know, I don't think you would be in that kind of work unless you did have compassion and care about human beings. So there's a lot of problems and, and things that people are suffering, you know, here. Uh, the stresses of uh, living in Hawaii are so great because of the high cost of living, put stress on the family to just keep up. And that has to be understood. And solutions, long-term solutions have to be generated that will help them move from, uh, move out of these stresses so they can enjoy a high quality of life. Mm, we need that. So, uh, you know, political life in Hawaii is tough, and so are campaigns for that matter. <laughs> they say in Hawaii, uh, politics is a blood sport. They say that. That's, uh, and here you are, a businessman and a, you know, a, a, a person who does good works, and you want to enter that? Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, can you handle that? I mean, mm -hmm. are you ready for that? Because it, it, won't, it won't be easy running a city with political interests all around you and traps in every direction. Right. You know, the, uh, one of the aspects that really bothers me is the political process itself that you just described. I think it's 
it can corrupt people as they get into it. Because in Hawaii, and I've learned this firsthand now that I'm trying to uh, get some traction and get some recognition, to be successful, you politicians take uh, special interest money, the endorsements, they, their promises that are made to these people, and, or their expectations. And it interferes with these very smart people who are running for office and are elected to office, and it interferes with their setting of priorities. It interferes with their uh, decision making. I mean, a good point is a rail. Uh, it's unbelievable to me. And, and one of the things I used to yell at my television about all the time was... <laughs> <laughs> I can see yelling at it. I do that too. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> and it didn't answer me back, and I got no satisfaction from it. But the rail was never intended or offered to us to solve traffic congestion. When I read in the uh, EIS, the uh, Environmental Impact Statement, it, I, I, you know, it states very clearly that rail will be worse. I mean, uh, when we build rail, traffic congestion will be worse than it is now. So I'm living in West Oahu, so as I'm driving out and I'm sitting in there for my hour, it's never going to be better. And in fact, they say it's going to be about 21% worse after rail is built. So going forward, any long-term solution to where we are with rail has got to include a uh, consideration of how that decision will impact traffic congestion now. I, I, don't, I think our people want a better quality of life, and they certainly don't get it by staying in traffic for an hour. Well, I, um, I'm interested in unfunded liabilities. In our discussion just before the show, you're very interested in unfunded right. liabilities. And the rail is on that balance sheet somewhere, along with a lot of other unfunded liabilities. How do you see that? Again, what got me so frustrated, because I don't understand how people are making decisions. Prior to making a decision to go into the rail project, and spend anywhere from five to ten billion dollars. The, the city and county of Honolulu had unfunded liabilities of 1.4 billion for uh, the pension plan of the city and county workers, 1.8 billion for the city and county workers' uh, health care, uh, vision, and dental, and then 5.2 billion for uh, a agreement with the federal government to improve our sewage system, to bring it up to federal codes. We don't do secondary treatment of sewage. And so the estimate is $5.2 billion to do that. So there's and an... That's been, that's been um, a fact for a long time. For a time, while. But a we, long time. It's but we're not doing it. in before. Right. Yeah. We're not doing it. We're not, we're not yeah. addressing the problem, you know, because we don't earmark money to, to do that. We don't have enough money. In addition to that, then, then we go into rail, Okay, so we tax people more, but it, I, re I bored myself the other day by reading the audit of the rail, and in there there's, very, there's no talking about a sinking fund to replace rail cars and other things that deteriorate over time. And I looked and said, oh, okay, well how much would other municipalities be setting aside? And they set aside an annually about $100 million a year to replace worn out uh, infrastructure over. Okay, and then uh, we also, and it's not talked about very much, but the subsidy that the city and county will have to pay for rail is about 70% of the operating costs for rail. And the federal government can help, but the most that they've helped anybody was 23%, and that's in Portland, and then 18% in Los Angeles. So you know, we're going to have a, a 50 plus uh, percent to subsidize, and that's ongoing. That's money coming out someplace from the budget. So it's, a, it's an incredible Well, situation. if you take all these unfunded liabilities, or these liabilities, or whatever you characterize them at, um, and you take current tax rates, current income of the city, uh, it, it really, especially with the rail, because rail, so, you know, ultimately it'll be way over 10 billion in my, if in my opinion. It will be, too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, Parsons Brinkerhoff uh, did the job in the Boston Dig. I think it was three times the original. So <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. So uh, 
you know, it's going to be a lot of money. And, well, uh, and then when you consider all these other unfunded liabilities, um, it, it seems to me we're underwater. Yeah. It seems to me that ultimately we, we will not be solvent. I mean, you could even make that claim now. Yeah. Um, so what about that? I mean, cities can go bankrupt. Oh, yeah. The states we, cannot. Yeah, uh, and Puerto Rico cannot. <laughs> what's going to happen here? Yeah. I don't know what's going to happen. And if the leadership keeps coming and expanding. One of the thoughts that I had was we need to turn inward. We need to assess where we are. Just, you know, as a, as a community, uh, how are we using our land? How are, we help, how are we helping our people have a better quality of life? I think we've got to stop, look at things, and start a, a realistic plan to pay down our liabilities and get ourselves back on firm footing. I think the people, if they really knew what we were doing, very transparent about it, uh, and explain it clearly and, and uh, allow anybody to dispute it, you know, or, or criticize it and look at it, I think the people would say, okay, let's, you know, we're going to have to bite the bullet at some point, but I know where the money's going, and I know that it's being honestly applied to where they say it's going to be applied. Yeah. And I don't think we know that all the time. No. Now. And, and, and regrettably, the press has not made it clear. You know, it's like, for example, some, there'd be an article about how maybe we're underwater, but, um, but that passes, the fickle finger moves right. forward. And we forget about the article. Right. We're on to right. some other piece of news. Right. And the reality is we never fixed the first piece. That's right. So. Short attention span. Yes. yes. Because, you know, my wife and I talk about it all the time. People are so busy just surviving. Yeah. You know, we're just trying to make it through life. There's so much pressure on us. And, you know, I think that, you know, it caused me at one time to say, well, recently, as I'm thinking about these issues, why are we in Hawaii having so, such a large percentage of our population uh, homeless? Why? You know, what is it about Hawaii? And I think it's the stresses we put on ourselves. And they, you know, they cause, you know, abuse in the family, you know, because they're so uptight you know, they, you know, people will strike out on, on the ones that are they're close to. I think that uh, people just give up, get ill. And even when I was on the Big Island and, and taking and, and was in charge of the homeless shelter, what we found out was many of our homeless were w working two and three jobs. They started on to drugs to keep themselves going because they had such little sleep. And they end up home, you know, things blow up and they're homeless. The so old story. I, it's an old story. And, you know, uh, the news I've just been reading is talking about a really a, a coming back of a lot of uh, meth and other drugs that are uh, being used here in Hawaii. So. That's Ron Hokley. He's, he's uh, trained in philosophy, among other things. So he's got philosophy, he's got business. He's been following the community and doing works, good works for it for many years, completely invested in Hawaii. Yeah. And um, we're going to take a break, but when we come back, we're going to discuss how the press and the organizers of the uh, upcoming uh, mayoral debate uh, are treating him <laughs> and whether they're treating him properly. We'll be right back. Aloha, my name is Danelia, D-A-N-E-L-I-A. -E and I'm the other half of the duo, John Newman. We are the co-hosts of Keys to Success, which is live on ThinkTech live streaming network series weekly on Thursdays at 11 a.m. Aloha. 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 Join us at TEDx Honolulu 2016. It's at the Blaisdell, July 9th from 10 to 5. The discount code is R-A-C-H-A-E-L underscore T-E-D-X-H-N-L. See you then. Aloha! This is Rez McJackal. The University of Hawaii football team under Rolovich is going to get wet this season. In case you didn't understand me, University of Hawaii football team is going to kick butt under Rolovich this season. So be sure to follow us on Think Tech Hawaii and Hibachi Top. I'll be at every game. And remember, aloha! We're back. I told you we're coming back. <laughs> this is Ron Hokley, an old friend of mine from way back when. And he's running for mayor. And good for him. Good for him because he is not a politician. He is a community person. And that, uh, that's really very important. So, 
you know, there's a debate coming up, a right. mayoral debate. And of course, we know from the national, uh, you know, campaigns that that's important because it right. gives you a lot of contact, you know, with the, with the people. Um, what is going on? Uh, well, I only learned that there was going to be a debate on this coming Monday because uh, Dijoux withdrew from the debate. So there's a lot of controversy about that. And I said, gee, I didn't know that. So I started reaching out to say, why wasn't I included? Uh, could I be included? I'm a viable, qualified candidate. And you're an official candidate. You official filed your papers. Filed Everybody papers. knows. And I, and I asked people to at least look at my background, to know that I got some substance behind me. I'm very much invested in the community. And would they consider inviting a non-politician, even though I realize I have no name recognition? But I got a sense that if people knew that there was an alternative to politicians, that there would be a lot of interest in my candidacy, a, a lot of interest in how I'm going to attack problems, uh, what my priorities are. Um, and uh, I'm not sure exactly what I would do in the first 100 days, but we should talk about that. Maybe talk a about bit. So, um, OK, I mean, I hope you do get uh, on, on the debate panel. Because um, I think it's important that we hear from you. And I agree absolutely that um, non-politicians uh, should be involved, you know. Uh, in many ways, non-politicians can be preferable. They don't, they don't go in with baggage. Right. Or set uh, influences on them. Or a way of seeing things that are not controlled by a party. This is a nonpartisan race. But, I mean, that's what it says. But what I'm looking at it, and it looks like a Republican-Democrat uh, mayoral race, you know, at least that's what it looks like to me. Yeah. And uh, so I will go in there with a very open mind. What I think I'm really good at is bringing people together who have demonstrated competency to get to solve the problems that we have. I, I don't have an, a hidden agenda except to make the, the quality of life better for all of us yeah. and my grandchildren and, you know, my children, my grandchildren. So. I think a non-politician not trying to work his way up. Let me just talk just a, a moment about that. What I see as a, a flaw in the political process is that you get into an office, you then, people know about you, they give you money if you will back certain projects or, or be in favor of things that they want done. And then that allows you to leverage your office to get to the next level of office. It just keeps going on. You know, we saw that. Occupational career path. Yeah, it's an occup <laughs> and, and that's not what I'm about. Obviously, my age, I'm not about uh, that. I, I really do care about Hawaii and would like to leave something for the people, you know, and, and to work with them to, to make Hawaii a better place. Yeah. You know? and instead of going off the screen and, and having them find all the trouble, you know, yeah. which I think is going to happen. Um, so... Um, you know, inherent in what you say, though, Ron, is the notion that it's time. It's time for a non-politician. It's t the people will appreciate. I mean, I, part of your thinking must include this. Uh, will appreciate me as a, a re fresh, right. refreshing person. Right. Uh, right. Can you talk about that? Well, when I saw what happened in national politics, Sanders and, and Trump, there was a lot of expression of support for these outsiders, like a person like myself because people are so angry with the way things are done. You just can't keep electing people to do the, and expect a different response. I mean, you just, that's the height of insanity. So I thought that this was, a, you know, that I'm sure that that influenced me subconsciously to say, hey, maybe now is the time uh, to try. But again, I believe with all my heart that if people knew there was an alternative, that there would be a lot of interest in my candidacy. Yeah. I, yeah, would you, would you agree with me that people are disaffected with government because they've seen the politician side of right. things for so long and the special interests for so long and the mistakes for so long that they really are looking for something better and, and they're disaffected and uh, they, they don't have confidence in the, in the no, system. They don't. You see it in so many ways. You do. You know, I, since this is, we're, we're talking and I feel natural here talking with you, but I thought in the 1950s, we had the same thing when the big five, the largest companies in Hawaii, had their special interests and controlled Hawaii. And there was a group of, of young men and women coming back from the Second World War 
that said, no, we're not going to allow that anymore. Those special interests are ruining Hawaii. And they took on those special interests that were there and entrenched for so long. And myself and other people are saying it's time for a, another type of insurgency or revolution to say, we're not going to just allow special interests to control us. We want decisions to be made, not just for to benefit a few, but to benefit mm. the whole population. Mm -hmm. That's profound. So um, let's talk about you know, what you might do mm. if you were elected. Let's assume for this discussion you are elected. Okay, you march into the city hall. Uh, In fear and trembling. <laughs> <laughs> what are your first steps? Well, I would assemble the experts who have demonstrated expertise in the rail. That's a huge issue. Uh, and look in a very quick period of time developing solutions. Since uh, the mayor and other people have said that we're going to stop at Middle Street, Civil Beat has shown a couple articles. Civil Beat shown one by Ray Suchiyama. And, uh, He's been here at this table yes, many all right. times. <laughs> and, and then Randy Roth, Cliff Slater, and Panos Panaveras uh, showed an article about converting the uh, existing uh, Skyway in the, to uh, buses. So, I mean, there are ideas out there. There mm -hmm. are people who will come forward if they know that they're going to be seriously considered in there. We, we don't have an endpoint that we absolutely are committed to. We're, the endpoint of building the rail, the endpoint is to reduce traffic congestion now and in the future. So I think we would gather, I would, that would be a high priority. And I'd be accountable for that. I would be accountable to, to present that to the people, all of the ideas, and, and labeling them in the order that we think is best the experts think is best and that I would agree with or my administration would agree with. So that would be top priority. Okay. But I'd also, all of those answers have also got to have some fiscal responsibility to them too. Okay. Um, so that would be, and, and homelessness is really close to my heart. Um, I feel very compassionate for the people, but they do not have the right to make all the decisions that they want to. They might have a they might want to make a decision not to be sheltered. I don't think they have that right. For the health and safety of themselves and for all of the citizens, I don't think they have the right to make that. Just like I don't have the right to make a decision to drive drunk. You know, there are a lot of decisions we don't have the right to make. And I think, for the, again, for the health and safety, that we have to insist that people are not allowed to be unsheltered. So. But at the same time, one of the first points that I would do is create a list, a centralized list, and know as much as I can, or the social services, as much as we can about who these people are. They're be named. They're not just homeless. I, I think of them as residents without shelter. So we would know who they are, what their background is, and that might give us some insight into how to, solve, how to get them sheltered. Uh, and and work with them. So those would be some things that I would do right away. How would how would you deal with the, uh, the the what I think we both agree is a fiscal crisis? Uh, how would you try to right the ship on this? I I get some transparency and communicate that to everybody. There was an article in Civil Beat the other day, and they featured uh, uh, Natalie Iwasa analysis of the uh, of the rail. Uh, you know all the math within that. She's my treasure. <laughs> she wasn't when she wrote the article. I got so enthusiastic about that that I, out. <laughs> I reached out to her telling her how impressed I was. Good for you. Good for her. And, and then she became familiar with my, my candidacy and is my treasure. Uh, you know, she's very smart. She's one of the few people that I have ever heard of that goes to all the city council meetings, the heart meetings, the ethics meetings. She cares deeply. She writ and she's got a blog. I mean, a sharp lady. What that told me is that we don't know what's going on, and, and we'd have to get a very good auditing group in to just see how are we spending our money. I'd like just to know that, and then see, you know, how we might deploy that best. Yeah. You know, um, 
part of the challenge of being mayor is to deal with the city council. And, uh, you know, the relationship between the mayor and the city council has been, yeah. what do you want to say, mm -hmm. up and down. Okay. Lo lots of the time it's down. <laughs> um, and you're a guy, you know, you have no hubris. You're a modest man. You know, well, and, and you, you know, can you deal with a, sort of the wild horses in the city council run? Yeah, one, one of the things that I did is deal with a lot of egos and things. When I was at Merrill Lynch, I got to friendship with a, a man named Stephen Covey. Stephen Covey wrote a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And he and I taught that back in, uh, in uh, Princeton to, to people at Merrill Lynch. And since then, I'm still licensed to facilitate the seven habits. And one of the main principles of the seven habits, the fifth principle, is seek first to understand, then to be understood. So I would really go and reach out and listen to understand, not just to argue points, but really understand the points. Because I believe everybody in the city council wants to do what's best for Honolulu. I absolutely believe that. But I think sometimes egos get in the way or careers, you know, future careers might get in the way. If I wanted to be the next governor, if I wanted to be the next mayor, if I wanted to be the next uh, city council chairman or something like that, you know. And so I would really, I think I, I, I've got the skill to listen to understand. Yeah. My wife might argue with that sometimes, but uh, no, I No, but I Marcus Aurelius would not. No, he would. He not. would agree. He would he, agree. He's a seminal person for this whole discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Look it up, Marcus Aurelius. He's referring to a book of meditations by Marcus Aurelius. <laughs> I happen to be reading right now. So, Ron, we have uh, we have camera. Mm, mm, we call that camera uh, Vivian over there. <laughs> And could you look at Vivian? Vivian is the people now. Okay. And can you can you talk to the people about uh, you know your your feeling about this election? Your feeling about this moment in history? Uh, your feeling about the need, you know, for somebody like you to run and to win and be mayor? Okay. You know, I I put myself up as a candidate for mayor, and much to my surprise, my family's surprise, because I just had had enough and felt that things could be better for all of us. I, I love Hawaii. I have grown here in Hawaii with the values that have been shared by the culture, by the people. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a hard worker. I will do the best I can to get the, the most competent, with demonstrated competency, people together. I, I have no hidden, hidden agenda. Um, I'll just work as hard as I can to improve the quality of life for all of us. That's, that's what I'll do. And then I'll, I'll leave. All right. And you are available for de debate at <laughs> any point. <laughs> Debates, forums. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Anything. you, Ron. Ron. Ron Hoakley, candidate for mayor. Wish you well. Thanks, Jay. Aloha.